Right, if you turn to 1 Samuel. Um, two apologies concerning the last talk. Uh, did you spot the deliberate mistake? Well, of course, old Robert, I know the Bible better than you and want your letter of resignation on my desk tomorrow. <laughs> Westwood did. Oh, no. I, was, I was duly stamped on. And, and, and of course, when we... When, when, <laughs> it's funny because, you know, he, he'd done three and a half months, he told me, without sinning. And, and then he goes and spoils it by stamping on my head about this. No, um, the, when we're doing judges, Othniel, judge number one, was of course Caleb's nephew, not his brother. So, um, Caleb. His nephew, not his brother. And uh, secondly, the, the recording on the tape was not too good. I, I don't know what went wrong there, but it can be heard. It is listenable, so um, to hope that doesn't happen again. Right, OK. Yes, well, of course, uh, my, my letter of resignation will be before you duly. Um, in, in the meantime, 1 Samuel. And uh, this, this book starts right at the end of the period that the Book of the Judges covered. And, of course, we saw that the, the time frame of the Book of Ruth was in the time frame of the Book of Judges. And uh, so you get to the end of Judges. Uh, the story of Ruth has happened in the time of Judges. And um, then it leads straight on to 1 Samuel. So our time frame for this book is around 1100 BC. That's, that's where we, we start off. And of course, in Ruth last time as well, we saw the highlighting of the Messianic family. And uh, the Bible continues that theme now. It's established, obviously, that Messiah is going to be a Jew from the nation of Israel. Israel. But now, through the book of Ruth, it's been established that the family line, the actual tribe, is going to be uh, Judah. And, um, and that particular family within the tribe of Judah. And, of course, um, what we're going to see today is the beginnings of the establishment of the kingdom of David. You know, David being... Uh, you know, sort of like Ruth was David's great, 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 blah, 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 grandmother. And, and of course, Jesus came from the line of David. So, so we're kind of like now homing in on the actual messianic family. And uh, right now, chapter one, and uh, we, we have a, a Jew, a guy called Elkanah, and he had two wives. One was called Peninnah, and the other was called Hannah. Now, Hannah was barren. She had no children. Peninnah did have children. And... Peninnah gave her a hard time over it. So it was bad enough for Hannah not having children, but also Peninnah used to chide her in regards to it. And uh, what she does is that because she's so heartbroken, and she's a believer, and she's so heartbroken about this, that she goes to the tabernacle in Shiloh, um, and uh, the, the, the high priest there is a guy called Eli. And, uh, you know, he was the high priest of that particular time. And... Um, he, he had two sons, uh, Hophni and Phinehas, and they, as it were, ran the tabernacle. So there was Eli, the priest, and his two sons, Hophni and Phinehas. And uh, off goes Hannah to the temple, uh, you know, to sort of seek the Lord about being barren, because she's so upset. And uh, what she does is she, she prays that if, if the Lord will grant her a son, that she'll commit him to the Lord as a Nazarite. So, so what she's saying, Lord, if you give me a son, I'll, I'll have a prearranged kind of vow that, that, that he will be raised a Nazarite. And, um, and what happens is that Eli sees her. She's there in the, in, the, in the tabernacle praying. And what she's doing, she's praying silently, but her lips are moving. So, so her lips are moving as if she's talking out loud, but she's praying silently. And, uh, and as a result of that, Eli concludes that she's drunk. Uh, she wasn't drunk at all, but Eli concluded that, seeing her there, you know, with her mouth moving, but no sound coming out. And uh, just sort of, you know, sort of chuck in uh, at this point, um, you know, in these days of uh, so-called Toronto blessings, uh, that when you get these rather strange things going on, that nowadays, in the charismatic movement, virtually anything is, is, is kind of given biblical backing by the fact that in the you know at Pentecost the disciples were thought drunk, so I mean if you're jumping up and down on the spot roaring like a lion, this is no problem because of course the disciples were thought drunk at Pentecost. So today we've got this anything goes. Well, I mean as as a sideline to this, here we have in the Bible a priest thinking that Hannah was drunk uh, just for moving her lips 
um, you know, without any sound coming out. So I just chuck that in that this this kind of um, tendency uh, amongst some Christians today to to cover the most outrageous behaviour with, well, this is the spirit moving because you know, sort of, um, you know, on the day of Pentecost, the disciples are thought to be drunk. So that justifies anything. It doesn't at all. It's just it's just daft. And um, but. Eli, thinking she's drunk, goes over to tell her off, give her a ticking off. And, um, but but he, he soon becomes aware that, far from being drunk, that, that she's actually in great distress and really seeking the Lord. And, uh, you know, so, so he realises his mistake. Don't, don't judge too quickly. She wasn't drunk at all, and she pours her heart out to him. You know, he was the priest of Israel, and she just pours out her heart, how broken-hearted that that she was. And so Eli pronounces a blessing over her and he just prays that the Lord will, will really bless her. And as a result of that, before long, she's pregnant. And um, she, she bears a son. I mean, obviously we're not, we're not talking, uh, you know, virgin birth, you know, here. I mean, Elkanah, she obviously went home to hubby and hubby has something to do with this. But I mean, the point is that she's not barren anymore. So um, she becomes pregnant and uh, ha- has a son and uh, they call him Samuel, which means requested of God. So, I mean, Elkanah and Hannah are very aware that, that Samuel was a gift of the Lord to them, very much as a Sue and, Sam, a Sue and Steve, uh, you know, sort of called, called you know, their little Samuel. I mean, he's a real, you know, requested of God as well, isn't he? And, um, and so what happens is that once little Samuel has been weaned, so that, you know, he's kind of like probably, oh, I don't know, three, four, however old it is, um, Hannah and, and Elkanah take him to Eli in the tabernacle and um, hand him over to Eli so that Eli is raising him uh, from the word go as a priest to be in the Lord's service. Now, this doesn't mean that, um, you know, that Hannah and Elkanah don't have a, you know, it's not that they give him away and never see him again. It's more like being at boarding school or something like that. I mean, of course, they'd have seen Samuel all the time he was growing up and Samuel knew who his mum and dad were. But the point is, it's, it's Eli who immediately raises him in the tabernacle to prepare him um, for serving the Lord. And um, so, so that's how chapter... Chapter 1 ends, and then in chapter 2 you, you get a, a kind of the prayer of thanksgiving that Hannah prays, and you know, just thanking, thanking the Lord for, for what he'd done. And she actually went on to have three more sons and two daughters. So, uh, you know, sort of that was a real prayer answered. Um, and uh, so, so she had plenty of offspring and certainly wasn't barren. And of course to that extent Samuel became almost like the first fruits that were given to the Lord. Um, and then also in chapter 2, we, we get um, a bit of information about um, Eli's sons, Hophni and Phinehas, who, who were also priests with him. And that uh, we learn that they are completely corrupt. I mean, they are two real baddies. I mean, priests they may have been, but they are real baddies. And, um, and the Lord speaks to Eli and, um, and, and tells him that, he's going to be replaced by Samuel and, and that his, his two sons would also be replaced and that the priestly line wouldn't continue through his family. And uh, so, you know, here Eli is told that Samuel is going to take over from him and this is because of the corruption of his two sons. And uh, then in chapter 3, and uh, we're, we're kind of... Um, Samuel's round 12 now, you know, so he's getting a little bit older. And uh, Samuel and Eli were kind of settling down for the night in the tabernacle. And uh, the Lord calls out to Samuel. And, um, but Samuel thinks it's Eli calling him. So, so Samuel hears the Lord's voice. You know, the Lord speaks audibly and calls out, Samuel. I mean, it might have been a bit lower than that, because I've, I've seen it in films that when God speaks, particularly in the Cecil B. DeMille films, his voice is a bit lower than that. It would be more, Samuel. But nevertheless... <laughs> The Lord calls Samuel, and Samuel thinks it's Eli. So he runs over to Eli, and he says, What do you want, Eli? Um, or possibly says, Hello, Eli, what do you want? Or something like that. And Eli says, No, I didn't call you. Now, th- this happens three times. Um, and Eli eventually realises that it's the Lord speaking to Samuel. So each, Samuel comes and says, Eli, what do you want? And, and you know, Eli says, well, you know, I, I didn't call you. And then Eli clicks. After it happens the third time, he clicks and realises that God is, is actually calling to Samuel. 
And uh, so, you know, Samuel advises, uh, sorry, Eli advises Samuel according. He says, look, this is the Lord calling you. Now, the next time he calls, you answer him. Know that it's the Lord speaking. And uh, what the Lord tells Samuel, I mean, Eli doesn't hear it, but what the Lord tells Samuel is that, that Eli and his family were going to be judged uh, and that they were going to be prevented from being the priestly family. And it was because Eli hadn't brought up his children properly. And, and here, the Lord makes it absolutely clear that it was Eli's failure to discipline his children lovingly and firmly when they were little. It was for that reason that they'd grown up, Hophni and Phinehas, to be real scoundrels, even though priests. And so serious did the Lord consider this that he says, I'm going to take, you know, I'm going to take the priestly line away from you. So what we have here is that the Eli is now having sowed to the wind uh, a failure of a parental discipline of his sons. He's now going to reap the whirlwind and it's going to come back, as it were, to haunt him. And, um, and the Lord, you know, sort of tell, tells Samuel that he must pass this on to Eli. And Eli afterwards is, is asking Samuel what the Lord said. And, and, and obviously Samuel, as young boys, is very reluctant to tell him. But eventually he does. And Samuel says to him, well, look, what the Lord told me is that because of your failure as a parent, he, he's going to take the priestly line from you and it's going to pass to me instead. And so he, he tells Eli this. Eli, Eli took it very well took it very well. He knew it was true and it didn't cause him any problems. And, um, and then basically chapter 3 just ends by saying Samuel sort of like grew up, continued to grow up and, and became a prophet to all Israel. Um, chapter 4 kind of carries on the chronology from chapter 3. And uh, so, so this is still, you know, sort of like before Samuel was, was fully old. And uh, what happens is that, that, that Israel ends up in battle against the Philistines. They get attacked by the Philistines. And uh, don't do too well, they're being beaten, so the Philistines are beating Israel up, which, which of course is a, usually a sign that Israel was out of fellowship with God. And then what we saw when there wasn't godly leadership, then the people tended to be out of fellowship. And Eli, though, though saintly and godly in himself, you know, his two sons who were also the priests were, you know, morally corrupt, and you know, so it was, it was a right old mess. And uh, so, so what happens is that the Israeli army, because they're being beaten by the Philistines, they, they send to Shiloh, and, uh, you know, which is where the tabernacle were, and Hophni and Phinehas get the ark, and they, they, they take the ark to the battlefield in the hope that having the ark there would mean that they'd win the battle. Now, obviously, the ark represented the presence of God, but there was nothing magic or superstitious about it. I mean, when, when the presence of the ark caused supernatural things to happen, it was because God was there, not because the ark was there. And in this instance, they took the ark to the battle and it didn't make the slightest bit of difference, and they lost because God wasn't with them. You know, it, it was as simply as that. And, 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 you know, the Israeli army were completely routed, and uh, the ark was captured by the Philistines, so now the Philistines are having it away on their toes with the ark. I mean, this, this is bad news. I mean, this is Israel, as, as, as low as you can get, virtually. And Hophni and Phinehas are killed as a result of it. So, so they've taken the ark to enable the army to win, and the Philistines have beaten them, killed Phinehas and Hophni, and taken the ark. So, so now Israel has lost the ark. Now, Eli is 98 years old at this particular time, and he hears the news that his children have been killed and that the ark has been captured by the Philistines and the Israeli army have been defeated. And, and he falls off his chair in shock and, and he breaks his neck and, and dies. So, so, you know, sort of like there is God's judgment on, on Eli and his, his, his children. And um, Phinehas, his wife, was pregnant. And when she hears the news that her husband was, was dead, she goes into premature labour and, and gives birth to a son. And um, she died as a result of the birth, but before she died, she named the son Ichabod, which, which means no glory. And, and she named him Ichabod as, as a kind of, you know, saying that the glory had departed from Israel. The ark, symbolizing God's presence, had been captured by the Philistines. The glory, the presence of God, the Shekinah glory, is now no longer with his people. And, uh, you know, so, so here we see Israel, again, a lack of godly leadership and Israel, absolute, the glory has departed.
completely out of fellowship and, and the Lord in that sense not with them. Now chapter 5 tells us what happens to the ark on its journeys now it's been captured to the Philistines and um, they they take it to Ashdod which, which was like their big capital city and they had their main temple there to, to the fish god called Dagon and um, anyway, a Dagon by that they didn't pray to him either oh, oh sorry anyway the next morning okay they 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 put the ark in the temple of Dagon and uh, the next morning they go in and the idol of Dagon is fallen on his face see and so they they, they stand him up, you know, this idol, you know, and put him back where he should be. And uh, the, the next morning, they go back in the temple. And this time, not, not only is old Dagon flat on his face, but his head and arms have broken off now. You know, and their, their idol is, is in pieces. And uh, then all the people in the city break out in, in, in skin tumours. And, and there is absolute pandemonium in the city as they realise... That, that, that God's judgment is coming on them because they've had it away on their toes with the ark. So what they do then is they, 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 they send the ark to Gath, which was another Philistine city. So, so the ark now goes to Gath. And, um, and as soon as it gets there, the plague of tumours happen. All the people in the city of uh, Gath come out in these tumours. And uh, so, so then they're, they're very keen to get rid of this. I mean, this is, this is past the parcel gone mad, this is. <laughs> and so, 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 so they, they try to send it to Ekron, get, you know, the next city, as it were, down the line. But the people there, as soon as they heard that the ark was coming their way, they actually start dying of fear. They are so <laughs> frightened that they start dying of sheer panic and wouldn't allow it in the city at all. So in chapter 6, the Philistines decide that one way or, or the other, they've got to get shot of this ark. And they think it's probably best that we send it back to Israel. And what they do is they kind of, they come up with a little test. And what they do is they get this, this unmanned cart pulled by cows, all right? And what they reckon is that if they, like, put, put the ark on this unmanned cart pulled by the cows, that, that, you know, and then just like, you know, send the cows off. That, 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 that if all this trouble was a result of the Lord God of Israel and the ark, then they reckoned that the cows would head to Israel. So, so, so just for their own peace of mind, they decide to do that. So they shove it on the cart and, you know, I, I don't know, I suppose whack the cows with a stick or, 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 or something. And um, the, the cows duly head straight for, for Beth Shemesh, which was just inside Israel's border, the nearest place to, Philist to the Philistine stronghold. And so, you know, the point is that they, they, they know full well that it was God. And, you know, exactly what, you know, if we send the ark off on an unmanned cart, the cows will, if this is the Lord God of Israel, will head to Israel. And the cows did exactly that. So, so the ark, the Philistines are now shot of the ark, and the ark is back in... Um, Israel, and uh, the Levites recover the ark. These are the Levites in Beth Shemesh, all right? So the priests and the assistants there, where the ark kind of came in on on this unmanned cart, um, and uh, and seven, seventy of them decide to have a look inside. See, it wasn't every day that the ark of the Lord turned up on a cart. <laughs> you know, I mean, people were a bit caught. You know, oh, well, what's it like? What's it like? And 70 of them, they open it and have a look inside. Now, this was absolutely forbidden, so God strikes them dead. So, so 70 of them drop, drop dead for looking inside. Um, so, so, so they decide to, to send it on elsewhere, because now the ark's bringing trouble to them, and they're, they're God's people, you see. And uh, so, so they send it on to a place called kiriath Jerem, and a guy called Abinadab says, I'll look after it, I'll take care of it. And he appoints his son... Eliezer, a priest, to, um, to guard it. And so now the ark is back in Israel and being responsibly uh, cared for by a godly family who won't break God's rules about it because the 70 priests who looked in it and got killed, they, they, they were breaking specific instructions concerning the ark. Now, in chapter 7, we, we kind of go forward in time 20 years, all right? So, in effect, now Samuel is kind of fully, he's, he's all grown up, and, and he's, he's well into his ministry. He's well into his, you know, like, 
prophethood, or whatever you want to call it. And, uh, and signs of, of, of spiritual awakening start happening in Israel. I mean, Israel is in a dreadful mess at this time. And, uh, I mean, they're into idolatry and everything like, you know, it's a- absolutely awful. But, but Samuel leads the nation into repentance for idolatry. And so, you know, sort of like the people are kind of crying out to the Lord again. Very much the, uh, the pattern that we saw in Judges, because now they've got godly leadership in Samuel. And now the people following the example of that godly leadership are coming back into fellowship with God. Whereas when it was Eli and his sons, the people followed the example of that bad leadership and therefore fell away from the Lord and got into idolatry. So, again, we're seeing this important thing about, you know, godly and strong leadership amongst God's people. And uh, so, so the people repent and there's a kind of a national revival here. And, um, and then there's a Philistine attack. They, you know, the Philistines come in and, right, let's do a bit of smashing Israel up. But this time, the Lord gives victory to Israel over them because now they're back in fellowship. And in fact, the Israeli army, for the first time, now actually gain some of the Philistine land that they should have had in the beginning but didn't. Do you remember the Philistine land, Hampshire, down there? And do you remember that the pro- tribe of Dan had been apportioned Philistia down in Hampshire, all right, or Hampshire with an H if you're posh. And, um, but, but, but they couldn't beat them. And so what the tribe of Dan did, rather than stay down there and persevere, they migrated as far away as they could possibly get from the Philistines and went up to the North Norfolk coast around Cromer, didn't they? Only now, for the first time, the Israeli army starts to push into Hampshire, all right, you know, to the land of the Philistines and uh, to, to actually take that part of, of, of the land. And basically, what Samuel does for the rest of his natural life now is that he travels all around Israel, you know, in a circuit, literally like a circuit judge, and, and he judges Israel. So, in effect, Samuel is, is the last national judge of Israel, and that's what he does. He travels around in a circuit for the rest of his life, year in, year out, judging Israel, teaching Israel, leading them, um, etc., etc. Now, when we come on to chapter 8, uh, Samuel is now an old man, so again we've jumped on, you know, sort of quite, quite away again. And uh, Samuel is an old man, and he's got two sons. One is called Joel, and one is called Abijah, and they are judging Israel with him. So, in effect, Eli and his two sons were leading Israel badly. Now Samuel and his two sons are leading Israel. But an intense irony now occurs because the Bible tells us that Joel and Abijah were thoroughly corrupt and history is absolutely repeating itself. Um, Samuel has been no better a father than Eli was and his sons have grown up rebellious and out of order because he failed in parental discipline as well. And so, you know, a a dreadful mess. He didn't learn from Eli's mistakes. Now, it was partially in the light of this fact that Samuel's sons were so corrupt, albeit they were leading priests in Israel, that the people start asking Samuel if they could have a king like the other nations had. All the Gentile nations around them and the Canaanite nations in the land, they all had kings. And now Israel says, we want to have a king. Now, Remember, God God never wanted Israel to have a king. They were different. He was their king. They were different from all the nations. But now, the people are saying, look, you know, this just isn't working out. If we had a king, things might be better. Now, Samuel gets a bit upset by this. You know, he takes it personally, which is always a big mistake if you're in leadership. And the Lord speaks to him and says, look, you know, don't, don't, don't take it personally. It's not you they're rejecting, it's me. You know, so if, you know, if anyone's got to take this personally, it's me. But of course, the thing is, God doesn't take things first. I mean, God hasn't got a rejection complex. So he says to Samuel, don't get all rejected. It's not you they're rejecting. It's it's me. So it's uh, no problem. And uh, and, and he tells them to make sure that the people understand what the implications will be and the consequences will be if Israel were to have a king. And so Samuel passes this on. He says, look, 
You're saying that you want God to give you a king. Well, okay, but realise if you do have a king, all right, you think at the moment it's the answer to your problems, but if you have a king, you're going to have one man who's totally in charge of you, he's going to become your law, he'll be able to have conscription, he'll be able to have taxes, you see? And so Samuel's making sure, look, realise that if you have a king, there's going to be a downside as well. And, um, you know, uh, 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 and that, if they say, yes, we definitely want a king, and God gives it to them, that God isn't going to change his mind in later years. If they insist on having a king, and God gives them a king, that is going to be it, as it were. And, um, and of course, most of the kings, subsequently, that Israel had anyway, weren't good kings at all, as we're going to see as we go through the rest of this Bible survey. And in, in actual fact, it was a bad decision uh, that Israel was making here. And, um, you know, but I mean, the point was that, you know, that, that here Samuel is saying, look, be very careful, you people, on this thing about wanting a king. But they absolutely insist. And, um, you know, and so the Lord says, okay, I will give you a king. Now, in chapters 9 and 10, we meet a young man from the tribe of Benjamin called Saul. And... Um, he was out looking for some of his father, do, father's donkeys that had been lost. And uh, to cut a long story short, he's manoeuvred to Samuel, to the prophet Samuel, who is now old. And uh, Samuel wines and dines him, and then duly anoints him to be this king over Israel that um, Israel had been crying out for. So he's anointed. As, um, as king, and uh, Samuel uh, arranges a, a, a public proclamation of, of this fact at Mizpah, and, um, and when Samuel actually sort of does the, and, and, and now here's your king, sort of, here's Saul, Saul isn't anywhere to be seen, and they find him hiding in a load of baggage, because he's so nervous. But anyway, you know, Israel's king is um, been appointed. And it's this young Benjaminite called Saul. And uh, in chapter 11, uh, Jabeth Gilead, part of Israel, is um, sieged by an Ammonite king called King Nahash. And um, it looks like they're going to be marmalized. You know, I mean, all he had to do was move in, and that was it, the end of uh, Jabeth Gilead completely. So, and, and, and Nahash was prepared to offer peace terms. He says, look, I, I won't destroy you, all right? I won't completely destroy you. Um, but he said, my peace terms are this, that I'm going to gouge all your eyes out. Huh. So, some peace terms, all right, you know. Basically, they got a choice, I'm going to destroy you, or I'm going to just gouge your eyes out. You, you make the choice. And, uh, you know, so, I mean, this, this was, you know, sort of not a good position for Jabeth Gilead to be in. But Saul hears of it, all right? And he gets an army together, and so off they go to Jabeth Gilead, and they completely marmalise Nahash and, and the Ammonite army. And so God gives them kind of like, you know, a, a great victory over the Ammonite king. And this, this kind of really kind of shows the people that, that, that Saul is, is God's choice to be their king. And uh, in chapter 12, you have Samuel's farewell speech to Israel as their leader. Because, of course, he's been leading Israel up to now as a prophet. So we've had um, kind of uh, leadership by prophets, and it's now passing over to being leadership by a king. And, um, and what he does is that he goes, he just runs through their whole history, you know, from their deliverance from Egypt and, you know, sort of like through the, the wilderness and, and the period of the judges, all right? He just takes them through their history, and, uh, you know, so they can see how, you know, the record they had of unfaithfulness. And he draws their attention to, to the basic evil of the fact that they were wanting a king. And it was a basic evil. God had granted it to them. You know, that, that's what they wanted. But the point is, Israel at this point politically moved, now, now get ready for two technical terms here, I'll explain it, from what is known as a prophetic theocracy, now, a theocracy, a democracy, all right, is when the people are king. A theocracy, theos, God, is when God is king. So a prophetic 
theocracy meant that God himself was Israel's king and he ruled via the agency of men and women who were prophets and brought his word directly. That has been what's been happening so far. Moses was a prophet, Joshua was a prophet, all the judges were prophets, all right? Now they're moving away from that into monarchism. Monarchism, a monarchy, being that a man is king or a woman is queen. And they're moving now into a different political situation. And the point is a monarchy removes God by one point. Can you see what I mean? Rather than God being king, now there's a man who is king and the idea is for God to be sovereign over him. Although we'll see as we go through the rest of you know, the history of the Old Testament that very often it didn't, it didn't work out like that. And, um, you know, so the point was Samuel reminds the people that they're not into God's best here, all right? They're in God's what you might call allowable will because God says, okay, yeah, I grant you your request, have a king. But it wasn't God's best. But he assures them as well that the Lord hasn't rejected them because of it. Remember, God doesn't have a rejection complex, all right? You know, I mean, there are times when we reject him, aren't there? You know, every time we sin, we reject him. Well, you know, Praise the Lord, he doesn't take it personally, so he doesn't hit back. You know, he just loves us all the way through it. So, you know, the Lord isn't taking this personally, and, uh, but Samuel does remind the nation um, that, that God has the power to sweep both them and any king they have away if they get into really bad unfaithfulness to him. Right, now in chapter 13, we are introduced to Saul's son, Jonathan. And uh, Saul and Jonathan lead an offensive against the Philistines, and it goes badly. It goes badly. So um, this is fairly soon afterwards, and, um, you know, sort of like thus far Saul has kind of, you know, like had the victory in battle. Now it's going wrong. And uh, so he withdrew from the battle. He pulled his army back. Now there was um, a, a prearranged... Uh, sacrifice, a special sacrifice that was going to be performed at Gilgal. Remember, Gilgal was the base camp throughout the campaign of the conquest of Canaan. And, um, and there was a, a prearranged burnt offering to be done by Samuel. And so they break off the battle in order to go for that. But um, Samuel didn't turn up at the appointed time. Now, it's important to realise that only Samuel, only a priest, was authorised to do this sacrifice. Now Samuel didn't turn up when he should have done, he was delayed. And so Saul went ahead and did the sacrifice himself. Now that was a great evil because he was not a priest, he was forbidden. King he might have been, but he wasn't a priest, he wasn't a Levite, all right? And he wasn't, you know, of the, the line of Aaron at all. And th this thing that he did was great presumption. And, um, and then Samuel turned up saw what Saul had done and tells him that because of such disobedience, such blatant rebellion against him, that God was going to take the kingdom from him and uh, give it to a man after his own heart. So he's saying, Saul, you're not a man after God's own heart and, and God's going to take the kingdom from you and give it to a man who is after God's own heart. And um, also at, at, at this point we're, we're told that the that the Philistine oppression of God's people up to this point was so severe that, in fact, Saul and Jonathan were the only two soldiers who actually had swords and spears. Because the, the whole economy of Israel had collapsed. There were no metalwork facilities because of the continuous oppression of the Philistines. And, and in fact, Saul, you know, at this point, Saul and Jonathan were the only ones with armour, swords, anything like that at all. I mean, that, that changed very much from this point onwards, but, but that just shows us the devastation that Israel was living under at this particular point in, in, in their history. And uh, right now, in chapter 14, we, we, we home in on Jonathan now. This, this is Jonathan, Samuel's son. And uh, he, he undertakes a private raid against the Philistines with his armour-bearer. So, so he decides to go and do a few exploits for the Lord. And he gets his armour bearer, and the two of them go up against the, the Philistines on their own. And they, 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 they kill about 20 of them. Uh, Saul's leadership of the Israeli army now is not very good, and they keep getting beaten. But Jonathan goes out with his armour bearer and kill about 20 of the Philistines. Now, this creates a panic in the Philistine army. 
And so Saul sees his chance to attack. He, he hears what Jonathan and the armor bearer has done. And, um, and so he, he, he sees the panic that the army, the Philistine army is in. And so he uses the opportunity and he attacks, like strike when the iron's hot. And they get a great victory. You know, they, they actually, at this point, they, they now start to rout the Philistine army. Um, but Saul, Saul does something utterly stupid. And uh, he makes one of these crazy vows. We came across one or two of them last time, didn't we? And he, he, he makes this crazy vow that anyone who ate that day, because he said, right, God's given us a victory, we're going to fast today. And, and he made a vow that anyone who ate on that day would be cursed and put to death. So, so, so right, you know, I mean, it's one thing, isn't it, to say, right, today we fast, and, and Israel obey their king. It's another thing to say, today we fast, and anyone who doesn't, it's going to be a capital offence, and I'm going to have them killed. But nevertheless, that, that's what Saul does. And uh, Jonathan, who knew nothing about this order, ate some honey. He didn't know about the order, and he ate some honey. And he was seen, and he was reported to Saul, his father, he'd been eating honey. So Saul wanted to kill him, wanted to put him to death. And, uh, but, 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 but Saul's men managed to persuade him, that on the basis that the victory only came about because of Jonathan's courage in the first place. And Jonathan didn't even know about Saul's ridiculous order that no one was to eat, or if they did, they'd be killed. They actually managed to persuade Saul not to do it. But again, it tells us something about Saul, doesn't it? You know, I mean, it's crazy. Anyway, chapter 15. Um, the Lord speaks to Saul through Samuel and gives him an instruction as king and, and tells him that he is to destroy the Amalekites completely. All right? So the Amalekites, we, we saw them when Israel was coming through the wilderness. Do you remember the Amalekite army attacked them and there was a bit where Moses went up with Aaron on her and held the rod up and as long as he held the rod up, Israel provide, prevailed over Amalek and if he let the rod down, Amalek prevailed over his blah, 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 all that. Well, now God says, look, to, to execute my judgment on Amalek for doing that, you, um, I want you now to go and completely destroy them. So, so Saul a attacks them, wins the battle, completely destroys the army, but spared the king and the best of the cattle. Now, God had told him through Samuel to utterly destroy Amalek, which meant everything, men, women, children, beasts, cattle, you name it, the whole lot. So Saul decides to spare the king, <coughs> and to spare the cattle, the best of the cattle, to keep that for himself. Samuel turns up and uh, rebukes him, because this is direct disobedience against the Lord, and, uh, and, 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 and tells him, again, that, that, that God was going to take the kingdom from him. Now, if you just um, read verse, well, I'll, I'll just read you verse 22 and 23, um, because this is a fairly important verse here. And um, Samuel replied, Does the Lord delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as much as in obeying the voice of the Lord? To obey is better than sacrifice, and to heed is better than the fat of rams. For rebellion is like the sin of divination. Rebellion against the Lord is as bad and as evil as occultism, and arrogance like the evil of idolatry. Because you have rejected the word of the Lord, the Lord has rejected you as king. And then Samuel kills Agag, which, you know, the king of Amalek, which is what um, Saul should have done anyway. And that was the last time that Samuel and Saul met whilst they were both alive. They met once later when Samuel was dead. We'll come on to that shortly. And, um, and, and then chapter 15 just ends with this, and the Lord was grieved that he made Saul king over Israel. So, a very sorry story here. Anyway, in chapter 16, Samuel is now dispatched by the Lord to Bethlehem to anoint the next king. And he's sent to um, the family of a guy called Jesse, having been told that um, it was one of Jesse's sons who was going to be the next king. Now, this guy Jesse was an ancestor of Ruth and Boaz. I refer you back to the book of Ruth, Ruth and Boaz. He was a direct ancestor of them. So here we're coming on to the Messianic family. And uh, Samuel sees seven of Jesse's sons. Seven of the sons are at home. And, um, you know, he sort of thinks, oh, yes, you know, these." he looks at one, he thinks, oh, yes, that's the one. And the Lord says, no, it isn't. 
and then says, oh, it must be this one. Lord says, no, it isn't. He goes through all of them. And it's none of them. And it's at this point where God said to him, look, man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. See? And uh, it transpired that God's choice was the one son who wasn't there, the youngest son. He was away tending sheep. And uh, as he arrived, Saul anointed him as the next king of Israel. His name, of course, being David. And at this time, Samuel is now totally out of fellowship with God and is being tormented by an evil spirit. So now Saul is demonized, all right? And um, <laughs> believing that, that, that music would help, this David, who's now been anointed to be the next king, although that wasn't known publicly, he was also a brilliant musician. And it's discovered, or, or, or it's thought, that he's the best musician in Israel. And because it was thought that music would, would, would calm Saul's torment, uh, you know, from this evil spirit, that, um, you know, sort of like David is enlisted to be Saul's personal harpist, as it were, like to, to try and calm the torment that Saul is in, being tormented by this evil spirit. Now, in chapter 17, we have the probably one of the most famous stories in the Bible. We, we, we have the, the story of David and Goliath. And, and there's a standoff going on now between Israel and the Philistine army, all right? And um, what you've basically got is that they come to the arrangement. So those two armies can only keep beating themselves up, you know, sort of like so much, can't they? And it's really sort of, you know, picture it like two boxers in the ring. They're, they're both punch drunk. You know, like at the end of the Rocky films, you know, you, you get the big fight at the end of the Rocky films and neither of them can, they can hardly stand up. Now, what you've got here is they come to the arrangement, right? The Philistine army, basically, they say, look, we'll do this. Rather than all charge at each other and kill a few thousand on each side, we'll have a champion, all right? We'll put forward a champion. You put forward a champion, all right? And uh, whichever champion wins then his army has won the war. You know, this is kind of like, you just have two people fighting rather than the, than the whole of the armies, all right. And, uh, you know, so I mean, is, is Israel are kind of standing there now, gawping, because the Philistine champion is this flipping great big giant. And there's no one in the Israeli army who fancies uh, going up against him. So you've got this standoff, all right? And you've got Goliath, the Philistine champion, like goading Israel, saying, well, you know, come on, who's going to come and fight me in that? And, um, and then David, little David, I mean, he'd been out tending sheep. He, he was sent by his dad, you know, to go out and see how his brothers were doing. So he, he's coming now to the battle site, as it were. And he sees what's happening, you know, the, the, the Israeli army frightened of, you know, the Philistines and this Goliath chappy. And, um, and, and so what he says, he says, who is this uncircumcised Philistine? who defies the army, the army of the living God. So, so, so th this guy's showing a bit of faith here that the rest of Israel didn't have. But his older brother heard him say this and, uh, and, and, and retorted with, I know how conceited you are and how wicked your heart is. And that happens when, when faith is spoken amongst unbelief. Unbelief has to have a go at the faith and put it down. You see, because faith convicts unbelief. Because, you know, Eliab, all of Israel should have had David's faith, and David has this faith, but Eliab puts it down to David just being a, an upstart and that. And, um, you know, but I mean, he couldn't shut David up, and David kept, you know, saying, well, he's, he's not a problem. He's, he's a giant, is he? So what? You know, God, God's bigger than him. So is David spouting faith all over the place, and it spreads because faith does. And so eventually he's, he's, he's taken um, to Saul. Now, um, I mean, Saul, Saul, Saul doesn't recognise that this is his personal harp player. Saul is in a state he doesn't recognise very much anymore anyway. All right. But, but David is, is taken to, um, you know, to Saul. And what he says to him, he says, look, you know, the Lord has delivered me from the paw of the bear and the paw of the lion. Oh, he says, I've seen God delivered while I've been tending the sheep. The sheep have been attacked by lions and bears, and I've gone against them, and God has given me deliverance. And he says, look, the God who delivered me from the lion and the bear, he'll deliver me from this Philistine. What, what are we waiting for? Let's, let's go for it. And, um, you know, so, so Saul kind of says, oh, okay, go for it. And then proceeds to dress David up in all his armour. 
And David says, oh, I, I, I can't move, in, you know, in all this. So he takes the armour off and he goes up with his slingshot. Obviously, the story is well known. And, um, and hits him on, on the forehead. And uh, down he goes. And then David cuts his, um, his head off with, with his own sword. And um, so David really getting ahead in life there. Um, and <laughs> so, so David gets this, this great victory. Now, Saul had already said that anyone who defeated this giant, Goliath, would be entitled to marry his daughter or one of his daughters called Merab. Okay, so now David has not only defeated Goliath, but he's earned the right to marry the king's daughter. Now, in chapter 18, David and Jonathan, do you remember, Saul's son, Jonathan, they become, you really would call this bosom buddies, okay, and they, they're so close, um, they're such good friends, that they, they, they make a covenant of friendship, sort of like a blood brother type of thing. And they, you know, they, they, they just become so close and so committed to each other in the friendship that blossomed between them. And David is now given high rank in Saul's army, and he goes off on various skirmishes. And, and because the Lord is with him and not Saul, he, he outdoes Saul in military exploits. And um, so much so that, that, that a song came about in Israel that the women sang, and the lyrics were that Saul has slain his thousands, and David his ten thousands. Now, this, this started to get on Saul's nerves. And now jealousy grows. And remember, Saul has already been told by Samuel that his, his kingdom is going to be taken and given to someone else. And uh, so Saul gets angry and jealous. And he says, what more can he get but the kingdom? <coughs> and then the Bible says, and from that time on, Saul kept a jealous eye on David. So David is now being watched because Saul considers him to be a threat. And in fact, the next day he tried to kill him while he was playing the harp, but David managed to escape. So Saul is now insane jealousy, is taking over. Um, then he goes through, or Saul goes through the fulfilment of, of his vow that David should marry Merab, okay, because he'd killed Goliath. And uh, so he sets this up, so David thinks that he's going to marry Merab now. And at the last minute, he gives Merab in marriage to someone else, a guy called Adriel. So he breaks his promise there. And, and, and so, you know, he's really starting to, to act in a very unstable way. And what he does now is he says to David that he can have one of his other daughters, the one called Michal, all right. And Michal was in love with David anyway, but Saul was hoping that if he gave David Michal, that she would cause trouble for him. Now, Michal was clearly a very resourceful, but in the last resort, a very strong-willed and bitter woman, as we will eventually see. And although she loved David, Saul gave her to David, hoping that she would, you know, like end up turning against him as her husband and do him damage. Yeah, because Michal was a daughter rather after Saul's own heart, as we're going to see. And um, so what, what Saul does is he says, right, you can't have Merab, like I said, I've given her to someone else, but you can have Michal. But the condition is, all right, that you've got to, to bring me the foreskins of a hundred Philistines. Now, obviously, he said this in the hope that as David was doing it, he'd get killed, hoping, you know, for David to go up against a hundred Philistines, he get killed. That was what he was hoping. Um, but in fact, what David does is he goes out and he comes back with 200 Philistine foreskins. So, good grief, it makes your eyes water, doesn't it? But, but that, that's what he did. And, um, you know, so, so as a result of this, he, he marries Michal. And, and, and the irony of the situation, this is God's judgment on Saul, is that Saul's son and daughter both love David. His son, Jonathan, is, is his best friend, and now his daughter is married to him, in love with him. And, and all the time, Saul is growing more and more afraid of David, and more and more paranoid about him. Um, in chapter 19, uh, we get more attempts by Saul to kill David. And what would happen is that every now and then, Saul would just snap, and he'd go off his head, and he'd try and kill David. He is so jealous of him. 
He has got such hatred in his heart for him. But on each occasion, Jonathan and Mikal in cohorts manage to rescue David. But eventually, David realises that he has to flee. You know, that there's no way he can stay in Jerusalem and be safe. And so what he does is that he flees to Samuel, who at this point, now a very old man residing at a place called Ramah, Sa- uh, David flees to him, Samuel being the only person he f- really felt he'd be safe with. And then the two of them went off and they stayed at a place called Naoth. Now, on three different occasions, Saul sent men after David, found out where he was, and sent a band of assassins to kill him. Only the first lot that Saul sent, they got to David, and instead of killing him, the Spirit of God came on them and they prophesied. They couldn't kill him. So they went back and reported. Saul sent another lot. The same thing happened to them. Then he sent a third lot. These are trained soldiers sent to kill David. And they get there, and instead of killing him, they prophesy. You know, I mean, David is being protected by the Lord here. So Saul, getting fed up with this, goes himself to kill David and ends up prophesying. I can't kill him. So, I mean, you know, this, this really is being thwarted by the Lord at every, at every turn. Right, chapter 20... David, who has no hatred against Saul at all, I mean, David wanted to be friends with Saul, he uses Jonathan as, as a go-between to, to try and find out just what the situation was between him and Saul, because David couldn't really work out why it was that Saul was trying to kill him. And so he uses, you know, Jonathan as a go-between, but eventually, as a result of these kind of negotiations, him and Saul via Jonathan, David realises that the situation is, is completely irredeemable, that there is no possible way for there to be reconciliation between him and Saul, because he realised that Saul is utterly and totally determined to kill him. So, as a result of that, David knows that he now has to flee and become an exile. Now, remember, he's been anointed king. What's happened to him since he's been anointed king? Has he kind of got the promise of God and the next day, wow, it's fulfilled and now here he is, king of Israel? No. He's now becoming an exile from the very country that he's supposed to be king over. And, um, you know, so so he knows now that that his future is is going to lie in being an exile. And, and, And one thing to note here is that this friendship between David and Jonathan, notice the selflessness of it. Now, this is what friendship is. A good friendship is selfless, particularly with Jonathan. You see, Jonathan was Saul's heir. When Saul died, Jonathan would have been the next king. And yet here is Jonathan completely committed to David, knowing that he's going to be the next king. You see what I mean? And Jonathan, in his love and commitment to David, is completely selfless. He's prepared to sacrifice himself being king in order that the right and the good be done. And uh, so, in effect, he's surrendering his heirship of the throne of Israel to David because he knows that God is with David and not with Saul. Now, that is selfless friendship. That is the basis of all true friendship. Now, in chapter 21, we're told that the the tabernacle and the ark, remember the tabernacle was like the the mobile tent, wasn't it? And the ark had, had now been relocated, all right? To, to a place called Nob, all right? So try and get a handle on that, all right? Mm-hmm. A place called Nob. And uh, the, <laughs> just, just northeast of Jerusalem. And uh, the high priest there was a bloke called Ahimelech. So what David decides to do now, initially, is he flees there. Thinks, right, okay, maybe I'll be safe. I don't particularly want to leave Israel completely, but maybe I'll be safe there with Ahimelech in the tabernacle, blah, blah, blah. And, uh, but... But David didn't tell him that he was fleeing from Saul. In fact, he lied to him, um, made, made out that he was on a mission for, for Saul. Now, I, I think he does that to protect Ahimelech. So Ahimelech hadn't ended up, as it were, sheltering him, knowing, him, knowing that he was on the run from Saul. I think that, that's why David lied to him, I'm sure. So Ahimelech kind of looks after him, thinking, believing what he says, that he's on a mission um, from, from Saul. 
and um, and it's at this point that Himalek gives him the consecrated bread from the altar, all right, as Jesus referred to that, and also he gives him Goliath's sword. Now, Goliath's sword had been kept in the tabernacle since David had used it to actually kill Goliath, and so now David gets that sword, and, and, and he's got that now for his own personal use. But while David was there, he was spotted by a real nasty piece of work called a Doeg. Now, Doeg was an Edomite, and he was Saul's chief shepherd, all right? Typical of Saul, this, having a Gentile for a chief shepherd, and particularly a nasty piece of work like him. And uh, so Doeg, the Edomite, and you'll see what a nasty piece of work he is later on, uh, spots David and sees that he, he's there um, at Nob with Ahimelech. And uh, so, so David, knowing he's been spotted, he moves on. And uh, he, he, he hides in the Philistine city of Gath. He now moves out of Israel completely, and he, he thinks, I'll, I'll try my luck with the Philistines. But he was recognised. And as soon as he was recognised, he was captured and taken before the king, who's a bloke called Achish. Um, but what he did, because he was in trouble now, he, he was in real trouble, what he did is he feigned madness. You know, and he sort of like crawled around on all fours and he drooled and dribbled and, you know, things like that. You know, sort of, you know, sort of like what I do when I'm about to break a fast and I get my first meal. You know, you're drooling, aren't you? Oh, give me food. You see, so, so he, he, he's acting like a, a madman and, and Akish buys it, swallows it and, 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 and just tells him to throw him out of the city. And so, so he escapes there by, you know, sort of like, like the skin of his teeth. All right. And... Um, and in chapter 22, he, he, he eventually ends up uh, at a place called the Cave of Adullam. And um, he's joined there by his family and by 400 other people who eventually become his, his army. Now, the, these 400 people who joined him at the Cave of Adullam were what you would call your assorted malcontents and misfits who couldn't fit in with life in the promised land. I mean, they were Jews, but they, you know, the people who were in debt, it, I mean, these were the misfits, okay. And, um, and, and they all gather around David and, and, and kind of, you know, sort of like give their allegiance to him. And, um, you know, and David eventually, you know, starts to lead of them. I've, I've often, you know, I, I often think of us as the cave of Adullam, you know, I look round and, you know, we're all misfits one way or the other, aren't we? And, uh, you know, I've always you know, be, be, been glad, well, I mean, you know, I've always been glad that this story is here. I, I, can, I can relate to it at, at any rate. And, um, and so he's got these 400 people around him and he decides to, to send his mother and father to, to the king of Moab, um, you know, and ask him to look after them. Now, remember, all right, that, that, that David's great, 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 several times more grandmother was a Moabitess, Ruth. She was a Moabitess. So there was this kind of bonding between David and the Moabite nation. And so he sends his mum and dad to be looked after by the Moabite king. And uh, so, so, so here he is, you know, sort of like in, in, in the cave of Adullam with these 400 misfits. And, you know, it's sort of like every morning, you know, sort of like, you know, 400 tales of woe before breakfast, you know, because it's, it's a real moany, groany place. And, and a prophet called Gad turns up and directs David into the land of Judah. Now, Judah means praise. Uh, it's a, a, you know, a picture there, that, you know, that when you get into a rut, you know, tr try praise-like. And uh, so, so, you know, so David duly does that. He heads south with, with these 400 men um, that, down to um, the land of, of, of Judah. Now, meanwhile, back to Doeg, a, a real rotter, all right, the Edomite, who um, reports his sighting of David with Ahimelech to Saul. So remember, David had been with Ahimelech, all right? Doeg had seen him there. Now, David had lied to Ahimelech precisely to protect him so that he couldn't be accused of knowingly sheltering David because Ahimelech thought he was on a mission for Saul not running away from Saul. However, when Doeg reports to Saul that he'd seen David with Ahimelech, he lies about Ahimelech 
and tell Saul that Ahimelech knew full well that David was on the run from him. Is he? So this Stoic, he's a real stirrer as well. I mean, not only is he a nasty piece of work, well, he, he is a stirrer. This is absolutely awful. So Saul, now, having been misled, he, he wants to kill David, but now he thinks Elimelech, the high priest, is in complicity with David. Now, Himelech wasn't. This is pure false accusation and slander behind his back, this is. But Saul is completely without restraint. He, he, his conscience is gone. And he has Ahimelech and all the other priests of the tabernacle brought to him. And he orders their execution. Summary execution. Now remember, this is based, Doeg has lied to him. Saul, has, Saul is not bothering here to find out whether Ahimelech and these priests are guilty of the charge. He's heard that they're guilty. That's enough for him. He wants them dead. Because it's all to do with David. This is the hatred that's eating his heart out. And, uh, but his soldiers won't do it. They're just too frightened. I mean, to run the risk of them murdering the high priest and priests when the soldiers knew full well that this was all to do with Saul's hatred of David, this wasn't to do with any crime that the priests had committed. The soldiers were literally too frightened to do it. They, they feared God's judgment. And Saul couldn't get them to do it. So Doeg, he does it. He's quite happy to do it. So you, you see, you know, that n nasty. Um, so Ahimelech, now being dead, his son, Abiathar, becomes high priest in his place, because his father's dead, Abiathar now becomes the high priest. He escapes and he joins David, so he goes to find David. So, what you've got now, and this is important, you've got a prophet, Gad, you've got a priest, Abiathar, and you've got the king, David, together, travelling as a band. You see what I mean? So there, can you see, you've got prophet, priest and king, You've got the typology, the messianic typology of David's reign. David's reign is a symbol of the messianic reign. And here, prophet, priest and king is exactly what Jesus was, all rolled into one. Okay, So you can see the, the, typo the, the, the messianic symbolism really coming through here, clearly. Right, chapter 23, David gets reports of a Philistine attack on the town of Keilah. And he, he inquires of the Lord whether he should go and rescue the town, and, and, and the Lord says, go. Um, and he, even though they were all terrified at the prospect, I mean, these are, these are not soldiers. I mean, these were all men in hiding, a motley crew, to say the least. And, 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 and here they are saying, you know, Lord, do you want us to go and, and, and save the town of Keilah? And the Lord says, yes. So there's considerable bravery here. You know, these guys weren't trained soldiers, but David, as their lead, they say, right, OK, let's, let's, let's go and do it. So, I mean, they're shaking in their boots, but they win the battle, all right? The Lord gives them victory. So Keilah is saved from the Philistine army. Uh, they, they then hear that Saul has found out that they're at Keilah and is on his way, because the moment Saul got a report of where David was. I mean, he, he, he was on his, his horse and he was away after him. You know, Saul lived for one thing now, and that was to kill David. And so, so, so they hear that Saul, that Saul has found out that they're there and he's after them. And the Lord also told them that um, if they stayed in Keilah, the men of Keilah would, would hand them over. I mean, some thanks. You know, they've saved the men of Keilah. And the Lord says, get out of Keilah, because when Saul gets here, those men who you've saved are going to hand you over to the king. And so, you know, they think, right, time to have it away on our toes, and off they go. And uh, now he's got 600 men, so he's actually picky, he's picked up a few from, from Keilah now. So, you know, David now leads an army of 600. And uh, they, they end up in a place called Horesh, uh, which was in the desert region, region of Ziph which is down in Surrey, like, okay. And um, Jonathan finds them there, and, uh, you know, he manages to locate them, and, and he pledges official loyalty now to David as his king. So there you've got the selflessness. Jonathan was the heir to the throne. Saul was the king. He was the king's oldest son. 
He was the heir to the throne, but now he pledges official loyalty to David as his king. And he tells him that Saul, his dad, knows really that David is going to be the king as well. So even though Saul is desperately fighting against David, Saul knew in his heart what, what was going to happen. You can't, you can't fight God and win. You, you, you just can't, can't do it. And, um, but the men of Ziph tell Saul where David was. So, I mean, David, wherever he goes, the Jews are ratting on him to Saul. I mean, he's, he's not having a very good time here. And uh, so, so Saul starts tracking him again. And, um, and, and he's just about to find him when there's a Philistine I incursion elsewhere in Israel. And so Saul has to go off with the army and deal with that. So David was saved there because just as Saul was about to, to get him and his men, they had to go off to sort out you know, a Philistine incursion elsewhere. And eventually David made his base at a place called En Gedi, which was down the southwest of um, Israel. Right, now in chapter 24, Saul tracks David to En Gedi, finds him, you know, locates him, and uh, goes after him. And, uh, but David found out in advance that he was coming. The Bible doesn't give us any details of this, whether this is because of, you know, espionage network or, or whether it's the Lord telling David. You know, I mean, it just did this that, you know, Saul finds him and David knows that he's coming, blah, blah, blah. And, um, and David hides in this big cave with all his men. Must have been big because there's David and 600 men in this cave, all right, hiding. Now, Saul goes into that actual cave to relieve himself. All right. So, I don't know whether he's a bit itchy and wanted a scratch or something. I mean, the Bible does, it just, just says he went in there to relieve himself. And not realising that, that, that just a bit further in the cave, there's David and 600 men, you see. So, what happens now is that David, I mean, because it's pitch black, David, he, he creeps up. And he cuts a bit of Saul's robe off without Saul realising it. <laughs> uh, albeit his conscience struck him even for doing that. Yeah, b because Saul was the appointed king. So, you know, so David knew that he'd done wrong even doing that. But when Saul left the cave, David followed him out, albeit a safe distance. And what he wanted to do was to use that incident in order to reassure Saul so that Saul could know that David didn't want to hurt him. Because Saul was paranoid about David. And David wanted to demonstrate to Saul that he could have killed him there in the cave, but didn't. And so he says, look Saul, I cut this off your robe. I could have killed you, but I didn't. You have nothing to fear from me at all. And uh, Saul goes all kind of soft and gooey and repentant and he talked about David my son and oh I've been so silly and all this kind of stuff and uh, and tells David that he understands that he is going to take over to him from from the king and it, he, he asks him he says and when you do take over the kingdom promise that you won't cut off all my descendants and and David agrees not to do that now chapter 25 starts off with the death of Samuel okay um, so bye bye Samuel He's off the scene, although we're going to meet him again shortly. And, um, and David and his men, by now, are acting as a kind of independent police force in Israel. And they're protecting homesteaders and farmers in, in the region where they were from bandits and wandering armies. So the point is that David and this army, although they're exiles, blah, 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 you know, outlaws, bandits. They're actually the good guys. And what they do is they patrol Israel, protecting innocent people from baddies. So you've got a real, not quite a Robin Hood kind of situation, but that, that, that kind of thing. Now, one farm that they kind of kept an eye on belonged to a bloke called Nabal. And he was married to a woman called Abigail, who, who was very beautiful and very intelligent. Um, Nabal, however, wasn't a very nice bloke, as we're going to see, and uh, he was also very rich. Now, what would happen was that because David and his men were protecting these farms, they would ask the people who they were protecting to contribute to their well-being. Now, we're going to make something clear. This isn't David running a protection racket. <laughs> All right. This is David and his men protecting these farmers from foes other than himself. Protection rabbit... Sorry, a protection <laughs> rabbit. A protection racket is when you say, I can protect you 
pr you know, if you pay me, I can protect you. It's like, oh, who from? Me, you see. Now, with David, he and his men were honestly protecting them from marauders and, you know, invading armies, blah, blah, blah. So what they do is, um, as was their habit, they, they, they said, you know, could you, could you spare us some provisions, you know, for us? Now, base, basically, Nabal tells them where to go, but not very nicely. He's, he's not a very nice chap. So, so, so Nabal really gives them the old heave-ho and tells him what he thinks of them. Now, the men report back to David and they tell him what Nabal has said. Now, David is so angry, he wants to kill Nabal. This is quite wrong. It's quite wrong that he wants to, but he wants to. And he sets off to kill Nabal. He considers it so, because this bloke has been so rude as well, and, and, and you know, happy to accept their protection, but not willing to give them food. David decides he's going to kill him, kill him, which would have been murder. However, a servant overheard the meeting between Nabal and David's men and knew that there was going to be trouble, because obviously he knew what his boss Nabal was like, blah, blah, blah. And so he goes off to Abigail, Nabal's wife, and tells her. Now what she does, because she weren't stupid, she was a good woman, she takes provisions to David. She gets a loads of stuff, all right, and she goes and finds David and apologises for her husband and says, look, I'm sorry for what my husband said. Here are the provisions that you ought to have. And, uh, and she says, my husband is as his name says. Now, Nabal means fool. It's a Hebrew for fool, and Nabal was. He was an absolute blithering idiot, all right? Now, David was eternally grateful to Abigail because she prevented him from committing a murder. Because she turned up with the provisions and apologised, obviously David didn't carry through his threat of killing Nabal, so she had saved him from murdering Nabal, and he was profoundly grateful, because she, she saved him from his own sin, if you see what I mean. And um, Abigail de then goes home, uh, but she, she can't tell Nabal that night what happened, because he, he was drunk, all right. Um, but the next morning, when he sobered up, she told him, that she'd been to David, blah, 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 and that David was going to kill him, but now he's not going to because she gave him food and uh, apologised. And, and his, his heart failed him, and the Bible says he became like a stone and died a few, di uh, a few days later. You know, and, and, and so there was God's judgment on Nabal, he, he died. And um, you know, the upshot of, or the end of that particular bit is, is that David married Abigail. So, you know, I mean, that worked out very nicely for David, didn't it? And um, he'd also picked up another wife uh, called Ahinoam. Um, Mikal, who, who was his wife at home, who saw, you know, Saul's daughter, um, she, she had been given to someone else by, her, by, by Saul. So, so Saul had given her in marriage to a guy called Paltiel. So, you know, da David's marriage arrangements were complicated, to say the least. Right, chapter 26. Saul is off David hunting again, um, which shows how meaningless his words of repentance at the end of chapter 24 were, didn't it? Because he's, now he's out trying to kill him again. You can get words of repentance, which proves to be words, 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 which is why, you know, the Pharisees by, you know, John the Baptist were, were told, you know, show works that befit repentance. Don't just say I'm sorry, be sorry. Do you know what I mean? Slight, slight, slight difference there. Um, now, what happens is that David sneaks into his camp and um, with his cousin, and um, while Saul was asleep. Now his cousin, Abishai, wanted to kill Saul, but David wouldn't let him. And uh, so what David did is he took Saul's spear and water jug, left the camp, and then from a safe distance wakes them all up to demonstrate again that he meant Saul no harm. He says, look, I've, you know, I've got your water jug and that. You know, look, I could have killed you, but I didn't. You're quite safe from me. And in fact, rebukes Saul's men for not taking better care of him. Because he says, if I could get in the camp, anyone can. And, um, and then once more, poor Saul goes all soft and gooey and spouts meaningless words of repentance and I love you David and oh I'm so sorry I've been such a fool and it's all a load of rubbish. Now then, chapter 27, David now takes his men and they settle in Gath uh, where King Achish was. Now that was the king who he'd feigned madness in front of but now, now they're friends, all right, uh, you know, and the, the king's happy to accommodate them and um, and hearing that they were in Philistine territory, Saul gives up trying to find them. He thinks, I'm not going to go into Philistine territory. So, so David is, is quite safe. Now, Achish gives David the town of Ziklag. 
Now, that was part of Israel, but it was under Philistine control. So, that is given to David for him and his men to actually live in. And they lived there for just over a year. And they let Achish think that they were fighting Israel, when in actual fact they were campaigning against the Canaanites. So David deceives, deceives Achish. Achish thinks that David is taking his army off to fight Israel, when in actual fact he's, he's, he's mopping up the Canaanite armies, you know, and destroying them. Uh, then in chapter 28, uh, the Philistines were a coalition of various kings, all right? There wasn't just one king over one nation. It was a coalition of smaller nations. And uh, Achish was just one of the kings. And uh, they gather a massive army together to fight Israel. Now, this terrifies Saul, you know, and, and he, he, he seeks the Lord to get assurance of victory. But, of course, he's out of fellowship. God won't speak to him. So what he does is he goes to the Witch of Ender, a spiritualist, an occultist, and asks her to bring Samuel back from the dead so that Samuel can tell him whether or not he's going to win the battle. Now Saul knew how wrong this was because he'd put all the spiritualists out of Israel years earlier. And, um, but do you remember back in chapter 15 Samuel said to him rebellion is as the sin of divination and now Saul's doing that. He's divining. He's going to an occultist. And to the witch's horror because she wasn't expecting it, she, she she traded in demons, but Samuel actually appears. He comes out of uh, Sheol, paradise, the believer's compartment, and uh, this being the exception that proves the rule, because the witch was amazed that it was Samuel, because the dead don't return. This was the exception to prove the rule, and basically Samuel says to Saul, look, you know, tomorrow you, you and your sons will be with me. So they were saved, you know, um, but, but, you know, it was the sin unto death. Now, in chapter 29, uh, David and, and his men are in a bit of a predicament now because they're supposed to fight with the Philistines against Israel. So how will the Lord get them out of that? Because they're fighting now with the Philistine army. Well, what happens is that the other Philistine kings tell Achish that they don't trust David and, and his men and tell the Achish to send them away. So he duly does that. So David and his men are, are kind of safe from that rather embarrassing situation of having to fight against Israel with the Philistine army. Now, in chapter 30, David and his men returned to Ziklag to find that the Amalekites had raided it and carried off their wives and children. So, what they do is, the Lord tells them to go after them, which they duly do. Uh, 200 of his 600 men are so exhausted that he leaves them behind and goes with just 400. And they find one of the Amalekite slaves who'd been left for dead, but the slave leads them to them. And so they beat them all up and get everything back, blah, blah, blah. And that works out well. But once back in Ziklag, the 400 didn't want to share the goods with the 200 who had stayed behind. Uh, but David was very much all for one and one for all. He says, no, we're going to share anyway. They were honestly too tired to come and fight with us. So there's a kind of retrieving uh, the, you know, all their wives and possessions because the Amalekites had invaded and carted them off. So that we see David very much all for one and one for all there. And then in chapter 31, uh, meanwhile, the Philistines had defeated Israel. Uh, the Israeli army ha had lost. Saul's sons have died in the battle, including Jonathan. All right, so they're dead. So Samuel's prophecy the day before, when he came up from the grave, you know, up from Sheol, um, has become true. And uh, Saul is 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 fatally wounded by an arrow, and uh, he asks his armor bearer to finish him off because he wanted to make sure he was dead before the Philistines got their hands on him, but the armour-bearer wouldn't do it. So what Saul does is he falls on his own sword um, and committed you know, suicide, because he didn't want the Philistines to actually kill him. And uh, then his, his armour-bearer, immediately after Saul had committed suicide, his armour-bearer committed suicide as well. So that's the end of 1 Saul. Now 1, uh, one Samuel, 1 and 2 Samuel were originally one book, um, you know, but it's, as, as the years have gone by, it's divided into two. David has become an exile from the people he was to be king over. And we see that God is preparing him for his calling through all the trials and tribulations that we're seeing him go through. So he's not king yet, okay. But next time, when we come on to 2 Samuel, we will see the, the, the actual reign of King David. Uh, I'm sorry that the last few chapters I've had to belt through them much faster than I planned, but that's because time is running out, so sorry about that. But next time we come back to Samuel, the actual reign of King David. 
So we'll finish it there.